And the webinar has begun. I see our attendees joining the room, always a very positive sign. Welcome everyone on this very chilly, at least where I am, Thursday evening, and welcome to another Civically Speaking with the American Repertory Theater. Uh, I'm Sarah Elizabeth Schofield Manser. I take she, her series of pronouns. I'm the Assistant Director of Special Events and Partnerships at the ART. I am a white woman with shoulder length, dark hair, and tonight I am wearing a bright red blazer and uh, a yellow t-shirt because I was feeling a sort of McDonald's color scheme this evening for whatever particular reason. I'd like to first acknowledge that the land that the Oberon and Loeb Drama Center sit on is the unceded territory of the Massachusetts people, and that I'm personally zooming in today from the land of the Pennacook and Pentucket people. And I encourage you to take a moment to reflect on the native lands that you in particular are calling in from at home. I'm going to drop a little resource in the chat for you, just in case anyone would like to take a moment of time to review that. Um, a few housekeeping questions. At the end of the hour, we're going to have about 45 minutes of discussion. At the end of the hour, we will reserve time for audience Q&A. And you can submit any questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And I'm noting that this is different from the chat feature. So if you would like to make sure that we see your question, please use the Q&A feature specifically. Again, handily located at the bottom of your screen. And today I am so pleased to say that we are being joined by Archon Bung, who is the Winthrop Laughlin McCormick Professor of Citizenship and Self-Government at the Harvard Kennedy School. His research, research explores policies, practices, and institutional designs that deepen the quality of democratic governance. He focuses on public participation, deliberation, and transparency. He co-directs the Transparency Policy Project and leads democratic governance programs at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at the Kennedy School. Uh, and the Ash Center has partnered with the ART on multiple occasions, including most recently a discussion series around our world premiere production of We Live in Cairo. Professor Fung has authored five books, four edited collections, and over 50 articles appearing in professional journals. He received two SBs in philosophy and physics and his PhD in political science at MIT. So we are we are in the presence of a true expert this evening for this discussion topic. Arkan, I'm so happy to have you tonight. Thank you for being here. And thank you to everyone tuning in at home. I will rejoin the program at the end of the hour to help out with the Q&A. But for now, I'm going to disappear and just be waiting in the wings. So Arkan, I'm turning it over to you. See you later. Sure. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that kind introduction and to the ART for hosting this wonderful discussion series on Civically Speaking. And thank you everyone for joining this evening to talk about a topic that I'm sure that we're all very, very concerned about uh, and is at the top of mind. Uh, if you're like me, I suspect you have been feeling a lot of anxiety in thinking about American politics and democracy over the last few years. You probably have been feeling this, and maybe some of that anxiety has brought you here to that conversation tonight. And so I can't promise to relieve your anxiety over the course of the evening, but hopefully after an hour's time, we'll emerge with a better understanding of our democratic situation, where we are, the possible futures that we will create together ourselves and what we can do to pave the way for a deeper, more egalitarian democracy in the years ahead. Uh, so I want to begin by sketching a picture of where I think we are and where we've come from and why we're feeling this great deal of anxiety that many of us are feeling. The times, they have changed a lot, to uh, paraphrase what someone once said, and how exactly have they changed? For most of the time that perhaps many people joining us here tonight are familiar with, uh, earlier political reality that spans, you know, maybe 40 years from 1975 to 2016, I want to characterize as a period of relative stability. I call this a liberal elite consensus. 
And that was a period in which there were uh, center-left politics and center-right politics, but a fair amount of agreement and a low amount of volatility. And then in 2015 and 16, a bunch of uh, disruptions happened. President Trump won the 2016 general elections. Brexit, the Leave campaign won in the UK. Populists emerged and seized power in many countries around the world. And I want to characterize the period that we've been in since 2016 as a wide aperture world. And then tonight, I want to describe those worlds and ask what comes next and what kind of politics will we have and can we create a deeper democracy together? So first, a uh, uh, sense of the terms, narrow to wide aperture. Uh, some people in the audience may not know what an aperture is because maybe you uh, grew up uh, without before or after the event advent of digital photography the aperture is the hole in a film camera and it's narrow this is a picture of a couple of apertures the aperture is narrow uh, when it's almost closed and lets very little light in and it's wide at when it lets a lot of white uh, light in as that picture on the right shows and I want to characterize this period from uh, 1980, 1974 to 2016 as a narrow aperture world in that a lot of people in politics and political parties really agreed on a lot of fundamentals, whether you're a capital E Democrat or a capital R Republican, you largely believed in globalization and free trade. You believe that liberal democracy was a good thing. You probably believed that it was the role of the U.S. to spread that around the world. You believed in welfare reform. You fought for free markets, even a certain kind of racial and ethnic inclusion in a meritocracy. In the words of a very important prime minister of uh, the UK, she said, a conservative prime minister, she said, there is no alternative, famously, Tina. And uh, in my terms, what she was saying is there is no alternative to this narrow aperture world. Um, Margaret Thatcher reportedly was at a dinner party in 2002 in Hampshire, UK, when somebody asked her, they said, Lady Thatcher, what do you regard as your greatest achievement? And uh, Prime Minister Th or former Prime Minister Thatcher said, well, I think my greatest achievement is Tony Blair and New Labour, her political opponent. And she regarded that as her greatest achievement because she said, we forced our opponents to change their minds and agree with us. We narrowed the political spectrum. And I think you could say something similar about uh, the movement from Ronald Reagan to uh, Bill Clinton and some of the Democratic politicians that followed him. So that was the narrow aperture world. The world changed a lot and quite suddenly, I think, after 2016, it became a wide aperture world in which many more ideas about politics, about where the country should go, became available and on the table for everyone to discuss. And these are ideas expanding out the right end of the spectrum as well as the left end of the spectrum. So you not only have globalization, but you have Make America Great Again and Brexit and nationalism. You have uh, serious democratic contenders proposing a universal basic income. You have uh, people proposing a wealth tax and trust busting. You have people proposing a kind of white ethno-nationalism as what America should be organized around. And most recently, and somewhat tragically, you've seen very polarized approaches to the pandemic that we're all facing. One way to put it is, uh, imagine if you had walked in, even as recently as the second term Obama administration, and you'd walked into the West Wing and you'd said, hey, I think we ought to really consider a universal basic income, or we ought to impose a 2% wealth tax on wealthy Americans, or we ought to break up the big tech companies into many smaller tech companies. I think that the, uh, the reaction that you would have gotten from those capitally Democrats was a polite, uh, a polite smile and a nod. And then if you'd continued on, you would have gotten a snicker and very quickly escorted out of the West Wing and your West Wing pass revoked because those ideas simply were not allowable in that earlier narrow aperture world. Now, I think it's by and large a good thing for democracy to encompass more ideas and a wider range of debate. But this wide aperture has created a crisis on several dimensions. And the first dimension of that crisis 
is social polarization. So this is a survey that uh, the Pew Research Center did in back in 2014, even before um, Donald Trump became president of the United States. And they asked a bunch of people, uh, do you regard the other party as a threat to the nation's well-being? And a third of Democrats at that time, when uh, Barack Obama was president, saw the Republican Party as a fundamental threat to the nation's well-being. And 36 percent of Dem uh, of Republicans saw the Democratic Party as a threat to the nation's well-being. And I'm sure that those numbers are far, far higher now. But each side sees the other as an existential threat to the country, large percentages of Democrats and Republicans. Here's another slide, a uh, more recent poll uh, in, conducted in uh, late 2019, asked people who are looking to get into a romantic relationship, Democrat and Republican. These are people who are looking to get into a relationship and they asked them, would you date someone from the other party? And seven in 10 Democrats looking to get into a relationship say they would not date a Trump voter and five in 10 Republicans say they would not date a Clinton voter. Now, this survey doesn't ask people whether uh, they have the same choices in music or same test, uh, taste in literature or art or plays that they see at the ART. It doesn't ask them any of those things. All they're asking for is party affiliation. And that's enough for 70% of Democrats to say, no, I'm not going to date somebody who voted for Donald Trump and 50% of Republicans. So we're really, really divided at the social level. It's just that that political flag is a, is a big red flag for even people looking to get into a relationship. At the elite level, so that's like everybody, that's a public opinion survey, but we also see a lot of polarization among our political leaders. So back uh, in the what I call the narrow, narrow liberal elite consensus back in 1973 and 1975, uh, Congress was mostly purple in the sense that 90% of the people in Congress had ideologies that were between the leftmost Republican and the rightmost Democrat. So here's the rightmost uh, or the leftmost Republican right here around negative 0.6. Here, I'll annotate this. Um, and here is the rightmost Democrat. And most of Congress is between the leftmost Republican and the rightmost Democrat. So uh, most of Congress was purple in that sense. Uh, recently, these days, there is no purple in Congress. There is no member of Congress in between the rightmost Democrat and the leftmost Republican. So uh, that's a sense in which our leadership is very, very polarized, more polarized, in fact, indeed, than in any time since the Civil War and Reconstruction in the United States. So that's the social dimension of the crisis of wide aperture and the leadership dimension. It also leads to an institutional crisis of delegitimation. And what happens when people are so polarized and politics are so polarized is that more and more people begin to feel that it's more important to win than for the rules of democracy to hold together. Now, if you think about it, Democracy is kind of a miracle in the sense that you have a bunch of people in society with really divergent ideas. They have believe in different gods. They believe or no God at all. They believe in high taxes or no taxes. They believe in a lot of social policy or very little. They have really, really different ideas about racial justice, about climate change, all of these issues. And what democracy requires is that if you get fewer votes than the other party, you put your values kind of on hold for a while and you let the other side, you acknowledge that they win and that they get to govern for a little while. Uh, when people, when that extent of disagreement grows really, really wide, it becomes very, very difficult for people to say, yeah, uh, democracy is more important than getting my way. And it becomes more difficult to say, fine, I'll put my values on hold at least for a little while just because the other side got more votes. And you see that happening in our institutions. Um, a lot of people, I'm sure, have been following the presidential election, which in a very real sense is not over yet in the sense that President Trump has not conceded the election, even though uh, the Biden and Harris got 
five, six to seven million more, six million more, five to six million more votes. Uh, and every network has called it. And there's been no evidence of widespread voter fraud. He still has not conceded. And it's unclear when he may do so. Most Republican leaders, by the way, have not uh, publicly acknowledged Joe Biden as uh, the winner of the election. So that's uh, one source of institutional stress. Another source of institutional stress is the Electoral College. Uh, the Electoral College has never been popular in America, but now I think uh, people are taking a very close look at it and uh, regarding as a serious, serious problem of legitimacy in American politics that the Electoral College exists, that it allocates power so disproportionately, and that it focuses a whole presidential election on just a handful of states. We also saw this recently in the Supreme Court um, nominations with the tragic passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the uh, very quick nomination and confirmation of uh, Judge Justice now, Amy Coney Barrett. And it's kind of astonishing to think that the passing of one 87-year-old woman, as distinguished and important as she was, historically speaking, put, could put the American Republic on a nice edge and create so much conflict. And I regard that as a function of the wide aperture world that we're in. Lately, when I've been thinking about American politics, the picture that I have in my head is a picture of a pressure cooker. And for most of the last 50 years, that long period from 1980 to 2016, the pressure in the pressure cooker has been very low. It's kind of been simmering along because a lot of people in politics, they had small disagreements, but largely agreed with one another. And these days, since 2016, more and more ideas, more and more diversity is on the table and greater polarization. And that just cranks the pressure cooker, the pressure in the pressure cooker way, way up. And I think the pressure is at a point at which the pressure cooker itself is showing some cracks. Okay, so that's kind of where I think we are now. What's next? What lies in the future? I don't have a crystal ball. I can't tell you what is next uh, in the next decade of American politics, but I do think it's helpful to sketch some possibilities to think through uh, where America might be going. So what I wanna do is sketch for you four different possible futures. Okay, where we are is this wide aperture world. One possibility is authoritarian decline. And there's been a lot of books written about this over the last uh, four and five years. And the picture here is that democratic elections, even elections are very, very fragile. Uh, we are seeing right now an unprecedented refusal to concede a presidential election. Um, I don't think it'll uh, last. I don't think it'll work. I think that uh, pretty soon we'll see a Biden-Harris administration in the White House but I don't know that. I can't tell you to 100% certainty that that's the case. And in, even in this election, but in future ones, are they so fragile that uh, even uh, the basic machinery of elections itself might fail and in its place, authoritarians might begin to reject electoral outcomes and have political power in America? That would be unprecedented. That's one possibility a lot of people have been thinking about. A second possibility I'm calling purgatory. And purgatory is uh, a future in which we stay in this high anxiety, wide disagreement world in which there are Trumpian and post-Trumpian ideas out there, as well as democratic socialist ideas, as well as a bunch in the middle. And we just get these big swings from back and forth and serious, serious disagreement that doesn't really lower very much the pressure in the pressure cooker. That's the second possibility. The third possibility I'm calling the Empire Strikes Back, which is we go back to this prior era of gentil, gentil liberal elite consensus. That's what I'm calling the Empire Strikes Back. And when I was first uh, developing some of these ideas, 
uh, I was uh, talking with a friend of mine and he said, well, why are you calling it the Empire Strikes Back? It wasn't so bad back then, 1980 to 2015. Things went pretty well for a lot of people, for a lot of the country. Why don't you call it Return of the Jedi? And I thought that was a good idea, depending on your uh, what you thought of that period from 1980 to 2016. It could be The Empire Strikes Back or it could be Return of the Jedi um, for you, uh, depending on which aspects you you focus on. And uh, my my friend, uh, he was prescient in the sense that I think um, Joe Biden kind of ran on a Return of the Jedi kind of campaign, return things back to normal, back to where it, what, what it was like before Trump. And uh, he won uh presidency in part based on when uh, won the campaign uh, based in part on that promise of returning things to normal uh, before the Trump era. We'll see if that comes to pass. And then finally, a fourth possibility is a deeper democracy. We shouldn't forget that this period from uh, 1975 to 2016 was marked by a huge amount of injustice and exclusion. We can see that in the racial dimension with mass incarceration that uh, occurred in that period. I think historians, when they look back, will write about that period as the period of rising inequality in America. And by to that, the late 2000, by 2010, 2015, inequality in America had risen, had grown to the highest levels in our history, at least since the Gilded Age, which is remarkable. So there are a lot of problems with that era. And uh, the fourth possibility is that we return, is that we get to a deeper democracy that overcomes some of the problems with that era. Okay. So now I want to ask you, uh, uh oh, I don't have the poll here. Uh, hey, Sarah, do we have the polls available? Maybe not. Yep, it's at the bottom of everyone's screen. There is a little poll icon between Q&A and chat. The question is, what will American democracy look like in the next five to 10 years? And I'm going to click launch polling right now so you guys should be able to vote in about one minute. Right, so these are the four possibilities that I sketched and everybody should pick one. What is your prediction? Do you think we'll see authoritarian decline or do you think we'll see purgatory? or back to the narrow aperture world of 1980 to 2016? Or do you think we'll get to a deeper democracy? And then, Sarah, when most people have submitted an answer, would you display the poll results? Of course. We're at about 86% of folks, so I'm going to give it five more seconds, and then I'm going to end the polling, which should display the results to everyone watching. Great. Thank you. I've done this poll a couple times before, but before the election, so I'm interested to see whether the election has changed what people think. All right, I just ended the poll, so the results should be visible for everyone, but let me know if they're not, and I can read the results out loud. I cannot see. Oh, yeah, there they are. They just showed up. Gotcha. <laughs> Fascinating. So uh, hopefully everyone can see the poll results. The um, the winner, or the winner, I, I hesitate to call it the winner, the, the future that most people thought uh, America has in store is purgatory, that will stay in this wide aperture world. And then second was uh, deeper democracy, which was very close to a return to the politics of old. And fortunately, only seven people uh, seven percent of people saw authoritarian decline in our future. So, just um, to give you a sense of what prior uh, pre-election audiences have thought, purgatory uh, was the winner then too, which is super interesting to me because because the Byers campaign kind of ran on the return to a narrow aperture politics, but uh, in this room, evidently. 
uh, most people don't buy it or they think that their effort won't be successful. Um, in pre-election uh, times that I've asked this question, more people, less than purgatory, but uh, authoritarian decline was more than 7%. So I think the election has given some people a little bit of a relief that the immediate threat of authoritarian um, decline from the Trump administration for people who thought that is at least uh, receded somewhat. Um, I'm an optimist, I, I, or uh, an optimist. I, I am hopeful for deeper democracy, and I spend a lot of time trying to think about what that would be like and talk to people who are working for that. So for the rest of the remarks, I want to sketch four priorities for people who are concerned with creating a deeper democracy. And so uh, here they are. The first one is democratic inclusion. And by this, I mean full, free, fair participation for all Americans. And I'm just going to talk about the electoral dimension, although there's lots of ways that people can and should participate beyond elections. In uh, 2016, I haven't updated this for the most recent election. In 2016, 55.7% of voting age Americans voted in the general election. That compares very, very poorly to most other democracies that have been around a while in the, uh, around the world. And indeed, the United States is near the bottom of the list, 28 out of 35 among, uh, among countries in the OECD for voter participation. And one of the uh, bright spots about this election, the 2020 election, is that more Americans participated, a greater percentage of eligible Americans participated in this election than in any election, I think, uh, in uh, 120 years. It was remarkable. Remarkable. And all of that was achieved in the middle of a pandemic. So uh, that was achieved because a lot of people, a lot of secretaries of state, a lot of people, poll workers, a lot of people, county election executives were working really, really hard to make it easier for people to vote. And in many parts of the country, they did that. Uh, these are some of the measures that are in, uh, that are available in places that have high voter participation, and we should strive to make them uh, first of all stick around after the pandemics, uh, and then spread them everywhere. A couple of these uh, are automatic voter registration, vote by mail should be ubiquitous. We saw that no excuse vote by mail. We saw that spread a lot in the pandemic. I am for an election day holiday. Virginia has that, uh, but most. Uh, almost all, no, no other state has an election day holiday. One interesting feature uh, in the last couple of presidential elections is we've seen the massive mobilization by many companies, schools and universities and civic organizations to encourage their employees and stakeholders uh, and customers to vote, which I think is really, really good. A couple of friends of mine, E.J. Dion and Miles Rappaport, have led a working group sponsored by the Ash Center and uh, the Brookings Found, uh, Institution uh, to explore the possibility of universal civic duty voting. And um, they uh, explore both the um, benefits and some of the potential downsides and challenges of this proposal. And basically, the idea is to create an Australia or a Brazil-like system where everyone has a legal obligation to vote and there's some more some kind of modest penalty for failing to vote uh, and, you know, there's all sorts of options like none of the above or write in. You don't have to vote for one of the major party candidates. But uh, th but the idea is to create a legal obligation to vote, which would, uh, I think, dramatically increase voting participation in America. Now, the other dimension of democratic inclusion, and this is really, really important and in jeopardy in our country right now, is that we should, everyone should favor the principle and demand the principle that voters should pick the politicians and not the other way around. And I want to play for you a clip, and the sound is a little bit quiet on this clip, so you might want to turn up the audio on your computer a little bit. It's a uh, uh, 
less than a minute, a 40 second part of an excerpt of a speech from Paul Weirich, who's a conservative movement leader, co-founder of the Heritage Foundation and some other uh, conservative organizations, giving a speech in Dallas in 1980. And here's what he says, listen carefully. The goo-goo syndrome, good government. They want everything. So that's Paul Weirich. And uh, for those of you who had trouble with the audio, what he says is, I don't want everybody to vote. Our leverage in the elections, that is our Republican leverage in the elections, quite candidly goes up as the voting population goes down. So he's very frank, at least to that uh, the audience to which he was speaking, about his view of uh, how <laughs> what the universal franchise will do to conservative power. And uh, his kind of his insight has become, I think, common wisdom among a lot of Republican operatives and a lot of Democratic operatives. And as a result, in many, many states, you've seen for years and years uh, moves to restrict the franchise of uh, voter suppression measures such as voter ID requirements, make it more difficult to, for people to register, purging voter rolls, disenfranchising uh, people who have are in prison or who have been convicted, and then gerrymandering. I also consider a uh, uh, move to uh, of politicians to pick voters rather than the other way around. This year, you've seen an escalation of these moves by politicians to pick voters, the set of voters to make it more favorable to them. You've seen messing around with the census count. You've seen um, uh, the aspersions of massive fraud and vote by mail. You've seen restrictions in places like Ohio and Texas to one ballot drop-off box per county. And then most recently, with uh, since November, with the president's allegations, you've seen the most dramatic escalation, which is massive voter fraud allegations justifying a denial of the election results. But as I say, on the other side of the ledger, ledger voting rights groups and democracy reform organizations have achieved a lot of wins in many, many states, expanding voter registration and same-day registration, expanding early voting and vote at home, uh, re-enfranchising felons in places like Florida, uh, many election administration improvements and independent redistricting, right? So those are the two sides of the ledger. And this first commitment of democratic inclusion means we should do everything possible to exclude things on the right side of the ledger and everything possible, not just to fight against, but hold accountable those political leaders that are advancing measures on the left hand of the ledger, hold them accountable for putting their party and their desire to perpetuate power and incumbency uh, and entrench their own position above the American commitment of free, fair, and fully inclusive elections. So that's the first commitment. The second commitment is political equality. And there are many challenges to political equality in the United States. I think the one that it gets the most attention, deservedly so, is about money and politics and the role, the unequal, dramatically unequal role of money and campaign financing and lobbying. I want to set that to the side uh, for tonight, although we can visit it in the question and answer. That's a very important dimension. But I want to talk about one that uh, people pay a little bit atten less attention to, and that is to the role of interest groups and lobby groups. The fact is a lot of public policy gets made not directly by citizens voting for representatives, but by groups that represent different kinds of interests of citizens in society, like the Sierra Club or like the National Rifle Association or Black Lives Matter or the Tea Party, the National uh, Abortion Rights Alliance. These interest groups lobby government, push for things uh, in legislatures and in, in uh, federal agencies to kind of advance the, uh, the interests of their members and their constituents. 
I think one of the most important, perhaps the most important dimension of political inequality in America is who gets a group. A couple of political scientists, uh, three of them, Kay Schlossman, Henry Brady, and Sid Verba, have done this wonderful study in which they look at all of the lobby groups in Washington, inside the Beltway, and they say, who do these groups represent? And then they compare that to the American population. And here uh, uh, in this chart is a, uh, a picture of Americans and what kinds of jobs we all have. And as you can see, 8.5% of us are executives, 13% are professionals, uh, and 14% are white collar workers, 35% are not in the workforce at all, 22% are blue collar workers, right? So that's like where Americans are in the workforce. And then, uh, Keish Lozman and Henry Brady and Sid Verba, they looked at the interest groups in Washington and they said, well, who do these interest groups represent? So I'm a professional up here. I'm a university professor. I get the American Association of University Professors. That's one of the interest groups that represents my interests in Washington, right? And here's what they found. They found that most of the interest groups in Washington represent executives and professionals. So it's actually incredible. 78% of people in these job occupations from white collar workers down to people who aren't in the workforce get 6% of the groups that they found in Washington, DC. Whereas uh, conversely, 21% uh, of the population gets 94% of the groups. That is executives and professionals, according to the study, get 90% of the interest group representation in Washington. So uh, the second really, really important thing that we need to do for democracy is, uh, is to create a structure in which everyone can have a group. I think that there are a lot of measures that would help out. Lobbying, lobbying and finance disclosure is important. Uh, I think a universal public service core would be really, really good because that would enable lots of nonprofit organizations and community organizations out there to get young people to work in them as uh, kind of, uh, during a national service year. Other ways of supporting community-based organizations. And then finally, I think we really need to think through new and creative ways to enable organization uh, workers to organize. What is the 21st century equivalent of the labor union? And um, these, these last remarks all have uh, some reading suggestions. I want to point you to a couple of my colleagues, Ben Sachs and Sharon Block at uh, the law school, who work on, uh, on a program that investigates possibilities for labor organization and labor voice in our democracy. And they produced a great set of recommendations called the Clean Slate for Worker Power, which offers a uh, many recommendations, many of them addressed at the state level, state and local level, that would enable workers to organize in this gig economy that we have, in this, uh, in this fissured economy, as my, my uh, colleague David Weil calls it. It's a very different time from the uh, organization of the economy that enabled labor unions to organize. And so we need to rethink those structures to enable workers to organize in this contemporary economy. Okay. So those first two recommendations or priorities might go down pretty easily. The third and fourth one may uh, find may be a little more provocative and people might have uh, some more problems with. The third priority, I think, is political choice. And by this, I mean that people should be able to vote for candidates and politicians and parties who really reflect their ideas and values. And it used to be for uh, the many of the last decades in America, we had two parties, Democrat and Republican. We still have two parties. And the thought was, well, basically, we can sort voters. Some are a little bit more left, and they'll go for the Democrats. And some are a little bit more right, and they'll go for the Republicans. But I think in this wide aperture environment, uh, these two choices do not give us uh, the candidates and parties that really reflect the interests and values in the population. And so really what's emerged 
basically since 2012, 2016, uh, probably back to 2012, but certainly by 2016, and we see it loud and clear in 2020, is not just left and right, but establishment and insurgent politicians and values, social values out there. And in uh, 2016 and 2020, uh, here are just some of the figures that uh, on the national stage that have represented these different perspectives. So on the left establishment box, you have Hillary Clinton, certainly, and the Joe Biden of old. In the establishment right box, you have many never Trump Republicans. In the insurgent left box, you have Bernie Sanders. And in the insurgent right box, at least in 2016, you had Donald Trump. Um, and so all four of those are clear, but then we have a primary process and we only have two parties. And so by the time it comes uh, voting time, you only get to vote for a couple of choices. And in 2020, at the presidential level, you got to vote for the left establishment candidate or the right insurgent candidate. And the never Trump Republicans don't really have uh, anywhere to go. And the left insurgents, I think, uh, this time around, by and large, rallied around Joe Biden, some of them reluctantly so, but I think that's how they behaved. Another way to think about it, between 1976 and 2016, you had a big Democratic Party and a big Republican Party. But what does politics look like after 2020? It might be that the never Trump Republicans and the establishment Democrats are pretty close to one another in this new world. And for convenience, you just might call them the establishment. And then I think what you're seeing emerge in American politics are new forces with new visibility. You get a post-Trump right that, uh, and I, we can talk about what their policy views and ideas would be, but then you also have democratic socialists who favor more powerful unions, much more social protection, much more robust government action to discipline the actions of big companies. And you can even see the kind of current leaders of these movements and maybe some of their inheritors who are younger, more energetic, perhaps more pure versions of, the, or more vibrant, more uh, up-to-dated versions of the politics that the older members uh, now uh, voice to us. And on the Trump right, you have Donald, who is the original Donald Trump. And then maybe after him, you have somebody like Josh Hawley or Tom Cotton, the uh, establishment politics. I think if you look at Joe Biden's history, he fits fairly easily into this category. And some of his successors might be Kamala Harris or Pete Buttigieg. And in the Democratic Socialist category, obviously Bernie Sanders and perhaps Liz Warren with their successors in Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and uh, people in her part of the Democratic Party. The challenge is to create a system of democratic politics that can encompass these wide range of views and that can give Americans the people, the candidates that really match their values. I think increasingly a two party system is incapable of doing that. Um, there are lots of proposals to uh, for political reforms that would allow people to uh, vote for uh, a wider range of candidates that match their ideas and values. Some of these are ranked choice voting, cumulative voting, multi-member districts, top two pri primaries. There are uh, a lot of different possibilities out there. For those of you who are interested in learning more about this, I recommend Lee Drutman's book, which is more important, I think, now than even when he wrote it, called Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop, The Case for Multi-Party Dem uh, Democracy in America. Okay, finally, uh, I think the last priority is citizen leadership in creating a new democracy. And so I think one of the unfortunate features of this polarized uh, situation that we're in is that the capital E Democrats could propose very good pro-democracy measures, but a lot of the population, 40% who side with the Republicans, because polarization is so intense, might oppose those measures just because they're favored by capital E Democrats. You might, if I think another group one that's less polarized, offered those same measures, I think you might be able to get buy-in from a lot more Americans. But 
Who could provide that leadership? We think of there's only two kinds of leadership, Democratic leadership and Republican leadership. But I believe that citizens can provide that leadership. Here's a story about Katie Fahey. She uh, uh, lives in Michigan. Uh, she uh, did a very important thing in the, uh, right after the 2016 elections. She was 27 then. And after the 2016 elections, she posted on her Facebook page. She said, I'd like to take on gerrymandering in Michigan. If you're interested in doing this as well, please let me know. And she got hundreds of thousands of reactions to her Facebook post. It went viral and she formed an organization that you think of as an anti-partisan organization. They didn't like capital A Democrats or capital R Republicans called Voters Not Politicians. And they proposed Proposal 2 in Michigan for an independent redistricting commission. Voter two got uh, Proposal 2 got 400,000 signatures, so they were able to put it on the ballot for the November 2017 election, and it won overwhelmingly with a 61% voting in favor versus 39% against. And so what they got, Proposition 2, created the Michigan Citizens Redistricting Commission. And so it was a citizen initiative that got this done, not a partisan initiative, but then also it is run and operated by citizens. So the Michigan Citizens Redistricting Commission is composed of 13 people who are randomly selected, much like a jury. Any registered voter who isn't closely affiliated with a government or political party can apply. 13 people are randomly selected to be on this commission. And this commission now gets rid of gerrymandering because they draw the district lines for uh, political representatives representation in Michigan. There's a similar structure that actually preceded Michigan that the Michigan proposal was modeled on called the California Citizens Redistricting Commission that operates in a similar way that now, since roughly 2010, ordinary citizens draw the district boundaries in all over California in California. And as a result, the California state legislature and congressional seats have become much, much more competitive. So that's, those are a couple of US examples in which citizens take the lead on democracy reform. And now, uh, if you look around the country, or I'm sorry, around the world, citizens are even writing constitutions. So uh, the 1787 constitution was not written by ordinary Americans. It was written by political elites, so-called founding fathers. That was back in 1787, but we've learned a lot since then. In constitutions today, many times ordinary citizens participate. So in the Irish Constitutional Convention in 2012, it was composed of 100 people, one chairman and 99 other people. 66 of them were randomly selected citizens from around Ireland and 33 were uh, representatives from the political parties. The Icelandic Constitutional Assembly, which got steam after the financial crash in 2008, was composed of 25 ordinary citizens, and it was preceded by these national assemblies that were composed of hundreds of randomly selected citizens. So there are ways of writing, I think the leading edge, the frontier, the state of the art of reforming democracy, of writing the rules of the democratic game now, uh, the, the, the state of the art is that it's done by uh, ordinary citizens who are well-informed and who have better incentives to create an equal and inclusive democracy compared to politicians who oftentimes have strong incentives to write in political rules that, will, that are meant primarily to perpetuate their own power rather than to afford citizens the greatest opportunity to pick the politicians that best represent their ideas and values. All right, so that these are the four things that we should really be for to create a deeper democracy, a full democratic inclusion, democratic equality, political choice, and citizen leadership. And so why don't I leave on that note, and we have a few questions, which uh, Sarah will help moderate. I thank everyone for your attention, and I hope that some of these remarks have uh, spurred some thinking and engagement on your part. Thank you very much. That was amazing. Thank you. I'm going to do a little applause now before the Q&A because I feel like I just got a crash course in so many subjects. So thank you so much for taking the time to walk us through that.
as you said, the Q and A is popping, which is amazing. So I'm going to do my best to navigate us to as many questions as we can in the remaining time. Um, I have a really wonderful question here. The, the question is a little long, so let me know if you need me to repeat any part. But given the widespread evidence of so many people having to wait for a very unreasonably burdensome amount of time to vote, sometimes all day, wouldn't it be a good idea to expand convenient, safe, secure internet voting? Internet banking has been very successful and highly secure. Other than an interest in voter suppression, what do you see as the problem with its adoption? And then there's a few like qualifying statements in there about ways that this person thinks that it is more secure than voting in person. But I guess the real question is, other than interest in voter suppression, what is the problem with the adoption of internet voting in your opinion? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, there is, there are uh, wells of deep expertise on electronic voting, and it's a or, uh, internet voting. It's a highly, um, highly contested space in which I am uh, not the expert, but people are quite worried about security and auditing. So, um, so, uh, so there's an identity issue. And then um, also an auditing issue. So in, as this election shows, uh, the president is calling for recounts in several states. And so uh, with paper ballots, you have a, a very clear audit trail and a history of how to count them up and, and uh, recount them uh, with, I guess, a fair degree of integrity and certainty. And uh, people are worried on the security aspect of uh, internet voting. You know, that said, I think the point is a good one. We conduct all sorts of very, very significant transactions and valuable transactions over the internet. Uh, some other countries allow internet voting to be sure. So I don't. Th I think a lot of the suspicion of internet voting in the United States is based on kind of uh, our own history and uh, the way we do things now. I think it would be really, really good to innovate and especially look to other countries and their experience and how they've addressed security, the security threats that they've faced and, um, and uh, where and how to overcome those. Now, I will say that uh, the United States, unfortunately, is exceptional in not a good way in the extent to which our elections are the subject of deep, deep contestation, right? And so the rules of the game themselves are part of this political battle, as I talked about. And so I think in a lot of other countries, they don't face um, the same kind of fights over who gets to vote and who doesn't. And so our Electro, our election system faces a lot more threats to its legitimacy than the electoral systems in many other countries. It's very unfortunate. That's an amazing and thorough answer. Thank you. We have some fantastic questions. This one is kind of large, but I, I think very important. Um, someone is asking, you mentioned that we have to hold political leaders accountable. How? How do we do that? Well, I think the... Um, the first way is to be very, is to acknowledge in the democracy space, I think that um, we've tended to think of voter suppression and messing around with the rules of the game as kind of these marginal activities that are on the boundaries or even long voting lines, as, as, as someone was, was mentioning. Um, I think it's time to bring those to the center and say those aren't kind of... Um, I don't know, uh, second order marginal activities, but those are a major part of what parties are fighting for. They're trying to create voters, the set of voters that's more favorable to their electoral prospects, and you should be held accountable for that. So um, there's a great YouTube. So one of the pieces of legislation that people should keep an eye on who are concerned with this is House Resolution 1, which is a democratic, capitally democratic proposal to uh, create all kinds of electoral reform, including um, public financing of elections, substantial public financing of elections, uh, campaign and lobbying disclosure, uh, independent redistricting, uh, greater uh, uh ease of registration, many, many good proposals, and election day holiday, many good proposals. And uh, Republican leaders have kind of mocked this proposal as a Democrat power grab. And the fact is, uh, if you believe Paul Weirich's wisdom of uh, conservatives do better when less people vote, 
then Democrats would do better with H.R. 1, but it would also enfranchise a lot more people. So people who snicker, the politicians who snicker at H.R. 1 should be called out very publicly in op-ed pages, uh, in le letters and calls and internet campaigns for mocking these proposals. It should be called out I believe it's un-American because it diminishes the franchise and it's an insult to political equality and our right to vote. I think there's all kinds of ways to call people out and hold them accountable. Um, I just think that less of that has been done because we haven't really focused on democracy issues until quite re in the last few years. Fantastic. Thank you. So many good questions in here, and I do apologize to everyone. We simply cannot get to all of them. We maybe have time for, I think, one more, it looks like. Um, and this is a great question. They're all great. This is a really great one. So this person says, I'm very supportive of citizen-led initiatives, but so far, many operate at the local or state level. Yeah, that's do we right. envision a model that works at the federal level? Yeah, so I think those... Um, the the Irish example and then the Icelandic example are national examples of uh, constitutional conventions that uh, in which they've decided big, big policies for the country as a whole. Um, in the Irish case, it went to a referendum. Um, I think in both of them, it went to there was a more popular kind of stage to it in which everybody could vote. Right. So those are examples uh, of actually empowered citizen led initiatives. Right. But you could also imagine ones that are uh, more like recommendations. Imagine if the Biden Harris administration created a national commission on democracy. And instead of the commissioners being um, judges or politicians or professors from Ivy League universities, they were ordinary citizens and that the federal government resourced these citizens with expertise. People like me would be at their service, but they would be calling the shots. They would be asking the hard questions and they would be making recommendations for the country, to Congress, to the president, to other people for pro-democracy reforms to adopt. I think that's a possible, that would be a very interesting experiment that hasn't been done in America about what a national level citizen led initiative, pro-democracy initiative might look like. I would love to see that. As would I. That's fantastic. We maybe have time for one more question. So I apologize if you feel like your response has to be truncated to accommodate the hour container. But this is another fantastic question. Um, this person is saying, I really like the idea of multiple political parties to move us to move us away from an either or dualistic right wrong confrontation. But what would have to change in the US government to allow that system to flourish? Well, um, that's a great question. And people have, over many decades, proposed uh, little changes that would allow that kind of multiple choice kind of thing to happen. So um, ranked choice voting is one important measure, which is in Maine. Alaska just passed it. It was on the ballot in Massachusetts. Unfortunately, I lost by a little bit. I voted for it. Um, and what ranked choice voting would allow is for you to specify your first choice candidate, your second choice candidate, your third choice candidate. And so say you're on the democratic socialist kind of little circle that I drew and your favorite candidate was Bernie Sanders and you put him as number one, but you thought, well, not that many people are gonna vote for Bernie. I'm gonna uh, put Joe Biden as number two because I'd rather Joe Biden than somebody else further on down the list. In, uh, in uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, in ranked choice voting, if your first choice candidate doesn't have a shot, then your vote goes to your second choice candidate. Whereas now, if we just had an election with, uh, you know, say Donald Trump and, and Mitt Romney and, uh, and, uh, and Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders, and they were all on the ballot, the Democratic Socialists might say, ah, I'm not really going to vote for what I believe in because I don't think Bernie's got a shot. I'll just vote for Joe Biden. And the difference with the ranked choice is that, say, Joe Biden wins, he can tell exactly how much of his support comes from the first choice voters versus people who picked him as second. 
right? And that that would allow a more uh, a more realistic, more transparent picture of who's supporting him. And there are all kinds of other measures too. I just wanted to call out rank choice because that's one. Another one is multi-member districts. We don't really have that uh, uh, in the United States, but it's possible. And a third one, which they do have in New York State, is fusion voting, where a candidate, Sarah, could run for both the Green Party and the Democratic Party. And if I was a Green Party voter, I would vote Green Party and somebody else in the audience, Sarah, as a Green Party candidate, somebody else out in the audience was a Democrat, they'd vote Sarah for a Democratic Party, and then she'd get the sum of those two votes. And then again, like with ranked choice, Sarah could tell, well, 30% of my support comes from Green Party voters, but 70% comes from capitally Democrats. That's how I know I want to make policy to re reflect that strength in my voting base. So that's another way you could get to some kind of proportionality in this uh, American system. And uh, yeah, proportion, proportional representation is in most democracies. It's very, very unusual in a modern democracy to have only two parties. And I think uh, in this, it you don't really feel the pain when those two parties don't disagree on very many things. And you know that was a criticism. As these, I don't really have a choice at all for many decades. You feel the pain a lot when in an era of polarization, like after the Civil War or like right now, when they disagree on a whole lot. Fantastic. Thank you again for such an amazing answer. I feel like I'm taking notes frantically on things I need to look up and research a little more for myself. And that now includes, includes fusion voting. So thank you for that, introducing that to my vocabulary. Believe it or not, we are at the hour mark. It is officially 6.30 and we are concluding the evening. Uh, Arkan, I just want to thank you so much for such an amazing and illuminating and educational discussion. This was fantastic for me and I'm sure the folks at home who were tuning in also really enjoyed it. So thank you so much for being here tonight and sharing your knowledge. Really appreciate it. And I want to thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, everyone, and, and stay safe, especially over Thanksgiving. Yes, please, absolutely. I hope that everyone at home is safe and comfortable. Um, in addition to thanking you, I would like to thank the Ash Center and just everyone for supporting the ART throughout this unprecedented time. So stay safe and have a good rest of your week, and we will see you soon at our next virtual event. Thanks so much, everyone. Good night. Good night, Arkan. Have a good night. Thank you.